case upon your shoulder. How could I live a day without you? How good it is to be around you. Oh, Lord, my strength, my soul. So deep is on you. Trouble had me weary, tried to feel me now. Almost had me thinking, there's no hope to be found. The voice of the accuser won't have a final say. Those are empty threats of yesterday. I'm waking up.
Thank you, Lord, that that invitation, that you started it, Lord, but that we get to walk it with you. New life coming out of the grave, Lord, that that's part of our testimony too when we say yes to you. And we thank you for that, Lord. We just put praise on our hearts and praise on our lips to give you honor and glory that you're worthy of today, Jesus. So we just say, come Holy Spirit. That power that we sing about, Lord, would it not just be a song today, but we just say yes to your power in our midst as we worship and as we gather. Just say yes to your spirit that was released because of the celebration of today, Lord, that the veil was torn. Just say yes to that today. Maybe that's new for you today. This idea that, that God wants to meet with you, that his spirit is real, but really what we're celebrating is that that was unlocked through this Easter Sunday, the first one. This all access pass to relationship and the spirit of God. So as we continue with worship, we're just going to pray that his spirit would come. If you're comfortable, maybe just hold your hands out in front of you like this. Just that position of saying, I want to receive. And I just sense the spirit is already at work this morning. So if you want that, just hold your hands up. Maybe you've never done that before. You can start today. The Spirit wants to meet with you today. The Lord wants to meet with you. So we say yes to that, Lord. We encourage that. And we just pray that we would receive from you, Lord, whatever it is that you have. So we say, come Holy Spirit and have your way.
says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything 
was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we cannot, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. testimony. is 
dancing with me. Jesus, we thank you. 
We thank you, Lord, that your arms are stretched wide and you are offering the invitation of new life, Lord. And sometimes that looks like new life for the first time, but for if you're here and you've been walking with Jesus, you know that that's more like a daily commitment. Lord, let me rise with you again today. And I pray, Lord, as our hearts are stirred through this day of Easter and remembrance, God, that, that we would just press into that daily commitment that you want to bring us out of death and into life. It's a repeated thing. It's a daily thing. It's a, it's a habit, Lord. Would we make a habit out of walking out of death and into life with you, Lord? We thank you that when we do that, that you create a redemption story for us and that you're in the business of redeeming everything. And we just want to partner with you in that mission, Lord. We thank you for your spirit at work as we sing out your praise and your worthy name, Lord. Just continue to minister to our hearts in our time today. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your precious, beautiful, powerful, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, happy Easter. Thank you so much for joining us in worship. Thank you for celebrating the risen King today. You know, and we celebrate in a lot of different ways. My kid's been singing that song, Dry Bones Rattling, all week, and he kept singing Dry Bones Deviled Eggs. And I'm like, however we celebrate, it's just a dry bones, deviled eggs. I'm like, you know what? Amen to that too. But hey, thank you for joining us and worshiping with us. Middle schoolers, you're going to hang out. Sometimes they have their own class. They're going to stick with us today. And everyone else, if you would, I know you just comfortably sat down. Maybe stand back up. And would you greet some of the folks that are next to you, around you? If you don't know what to say, just start with Happy Easter. Maybe get their name and go from there. church we are so glad that you are here celebrating Easter Sunday with us listen if you are new here we would love to learn how to connect with you so if you reach into the seat back right in front of you you're gonna find one of these it's a connect card please fill this out for us and then you can either drop it in the costly generosity boxes in the back or at the welcome desk and we just want to figure out how to connect with you better and get you plugged in here at church at this time in our service, we'll be continuing with worship with God's tithes and our offerings. We have a couple ways for us to give. We can text or use our QR code or... Easter Sunday with us. Listen, if you are new here, we would love to learn how to connect with you. So if you reach into the seat back right in front of you, you're gonna find one of these. It's a connect card. Please fill this out for us and then you can either drop it in the costly generosity boxes in the back or at the welcome desk. And we just wanna figure out how to connect with you better and get you plugged in here at church. At this time in our service, we'll be continuing with worship with God's tithes and our offerings. We have a couple ways for us to give. We can text or use our QR code, or you can use the costly generosity boxes in the back. But if this is your first time, no pressure to give, but you are invited to give generously like the Lord gives us generously. So this time I'll go ahead and pray for us. Thanks Lord for this time. Thank you that we get to worship through all the generous things that you've given us. I just pray you use these funds, use our time and talent and treasure to give back to you, to build your kingdom. Pray this in your precious, beautiful name, amen. P, P, P. Oh, hey guys, we want to invite you to a very exciting thing on April 28th, directly after service, we are gonna have pizza with the pastors. 
This is a great opportunity for you to come and learn about our vision, our mission, and our values here at the Vineyard. So if you are new and you've already filled out that Connect card, this is your next step. We want you to get to know us as a leadership team and for us to get to know you as well and see how we can get you connected here at the church. Well, church, if you didn't know this, we partner with an amazing organization called Cincy at the Well who helps people who have been in human trafficking. And during the month of April, we're doing a hygiene bag fundraiser where we're collecting funds so that we can purchase hygiene products for these people. During the month of April, if you feel led to give above and beyond to this amazing cause, please mark hygiene in your checks or cash envelopes um, in the text to give or in the drop down box. And we're excited to partner with this ministry to help these people. Hey, if you are part of our prayer ministry team, or maybe you're interested in becoming a part of our prayer ministry team, we are having a training, a prayer training, on April 7th at 9 a.m. before service. Hey, are you registered? For what? For the early bird special at the National Vineyard Conference! Oh, right! So this summer, July 15th through the 18th, is Vineyard National Conference in Cincinnati. Be sure today, the last day to register for the early bird special, tomorrow prizes will go up. Check out our website for more information. All right, you guys, that is all of your church news for today. If you want to find out more information about any of the things that we've talked about today, feel free to go online at vineyardflorence.church or on the Church Center app. That's, That's it. That's all. Huh. I don't know what's wrong today. Come on yeah. uh, to here with us, food eat. What's the like? Right is there a spiel? <laughs> <laughs> That's all, folks. What is that like? <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Beep, That's all, folks. That's all, folks. Well, hey, it's good to see you all this morning. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And those are really good announcements, guys. Thank you. Um, hey, you might notice you have a rock. This rock is not for if you don't like something I say. Now, I said, there is uh, one of our pastors here, Chris, said something to me, that, that might be a bad idea, a lot of people on Easter. And I said, well, there are some built-in advantages of having a very heavy pulpit and being short. So if they start flying, just someone let me know, and, and our security team will be glad, glad to see you out. Um, just kidding. Well, hey, has anyone ever tried to do home plumbing? Anyone ever, like, attempted plumbing? Anyone in here a plumber or really good with your hands and it went like pretty great? Anyone ever tried it and like, nah baby, nah? So I'm, I'm fairly handy and super cheap. So I will sometimes try to do things myself. And last year we were getting ready to sell our house and move down to Kentucky and we had this drain that was just super clogged in our bathroom. No matter what we did, we could not get it to flow well or at all. I mean, you'd shave and you'd have to like, you know, turn the water off. It was, it was, not, was not coming, um, there was not free flow no matter what we did. And I kept trying and trying and trying. And I spent about 10 hours of my life trying to clean this thing out, going to Lowe's, going to Home Depot, going to the neighborhood uh, hardware store, and I got my, went to my dad's house, got the crank thing, the snake, trying to get, and no matter what I did, I couldn't do it. Until I, my wife's just like, why don't you just give up? She's like, that's what there's plumbers for. And she's like, you know, and this is, it's, this is probably only gonna end worse than it's already been. And so I called my friend Joby. Joby's helping out the kids. Joby's a master plumber. Joby came there and literally, in 45 minutes, it's taken care of. But he told me, he said, I don't want you to feel bad. There's no way you could have ever got through this without the tool that I'm using. And it was like this power, almost like this like death auger through pipes. And he's like, and it was hard for this. He's like, cause your, your block goes all the way out to the side of your house. He's like, there was no way you were getting through this. There was a clog in the drain. There was something in the way. 
And what I wanna ask you today, and I want you to be thinking about these rocks, these rocks have a purpose. Is there something that's blocking God's presence and access and movement in your life today? Is there maybe something, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much effort, how many attempts, how much money you've spent, you just can't seem to break free? Is there a blockage in your life? Where do you need breakthrough? And today, as we gather on this glorious and beautiful Resurrection Sunday, we're drawn to a symbol that echoed throughout the ages the stone that was in front of Jesus' tomb. On Good Friday, we began talking about there being something in the way. And after, and uh, so the first Easter Sunday, they had a problem that they couldn't get through. If you'll uh, turn with me in your Bibles or look up on the screen to Matthew chapter 28, we're gonna read verses one through 10 together. It's on the screen. Uh, This is from the message version. So when I start reading, you read with me. After the Sabbath, as the first lay of the new week dawned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing. He rolled back the stone and then sat on it. Shafts of light and noise from him. His garments shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened they couldn't move. The angel spoke to the women. There's nothing to fear here. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He is not here. He was raised. And just as he said, come and look at the place where he was placed. Now, get on your way quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead. He is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. That's the message. The women, deep in wonder and full of joy, lost no time in leaving the tomb. They ran to tell the disciples. Then Jesus met them, stopping them in their tracks. Good morning, he said. They fell to their knees, embraced his feet, and worshiped him. Jesus said, you're holding on to me for dear life. Don't be frightened like that. Go tell my brothers they are to go to Galilee, and I will meet them there. So it's very interesting, there's an enormous rock. This enormous stone was placed in front of Jesus' tomb. That's kind of what they did back then, uh, first century Palestine, Judea. Um, A lot of times people, especially wealthier people, would have tombs that were cut into stone. They were etched in these big, almost cave-like, or these crags, they would be in there. But they would put a, a stone in front of it because, let's face it, no matter how much um, spices or balm or um, frankincense or whatever you'd put on a body, it stank. After a while, it would stink. And so they covered up the tomb, but in Jesus' case, they put an extra large rock because they didn't want the disciples, because they had heard Jesus say that destroy this temple and in three days I'll rise. And what they didn't want was Jesus' disciples to take his body and say, oh, well, he's risen. So there was a very large rock in front of it. Think of a big honking door blocking the way to the tomb. That's what it was. And so um, I think what this represented, not only to the people that were trying to keep the stink out and trying to keep a heist or a scandal from happening, I think to Jesus' followers, it represented um, something pretty harrowing that there was like the classic uh, song from the 90s by one of my favorite groups, Nirvana, said there was something in the way. Mm, If I had some hair, I would be going like this. And in the way. Yeah, so like, but, but, but yeah, that's what they felt like. There was something blocking their path. And 
my first question is, why were these guys, if they heard Jesus say all this stuff and do all this stuff, why were they not like people, anyone ever camped out for Chick-fil-A when they're opening a new store? Supposedly, if you're one of the first hundred campers, you get a year of free Chick-fil-A. Like, why were these dudes not like Chick-fil-A campers? Like, they had heard Jesus say all these things. They'd seen him raise a guy from the dead in Lazarus. They'd seen him raise Jairus' daughter. They knew this was possible. Why were they not camped out in front of the tomb? That's my question. Because I think for them, there was something in the way. There was something that had happened. They had just seen him beaten <clears throat> to a pulp. They'd seen crucifixion. Crucifixion was the end game. It was the end game, Thanos. It was like, there is no record of anyone that's ever been crucified, and we have over 1,500 records of anyone ever surviving a crucifixion. We've actually had people survive firing squads, people survive drownings, there's been all kinds of people survive things. There was even a story in, um, I think it was maybe 12th century England, where a guy's head came off and he was still speaking a little bit. So we've had people survive crazy things, but no one ever survived a crucifixion. So for the disciples, there was now something in the way to this thing they'd given their lives, their jobs, their homes, they'd given everything for, and now they couldn't see past it. So on that Friday, what we think was probably around April 1st or 3rd in the year 27 AD, it was curtains. They knew there was a veil between God's glory and man, and they were hoping that Jesus was the one who would change everything. The curse that came to Adam, that proliferated through the children of Israel, and then up to this very time, captivity after captivity, after stupidity after stupidity, people being enslaved and being estranged from God and having limited access to God's glory and presence. There was even a thing in the temple, in the temple that there was a uh, uh, parachet, which was basically a sacred curtain that was in the temple that covered the Holy of Holies to basically signify that when God cast um, Adam and Eve out of the garden, that there was a veil between them in God's presence, in God's glory. In this rock, I don't think it ever felt more... Um, more stark to them what the blocking off of God's present meant, the finality of a tombstone. But then something happened. But then something crazy happened. When Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, it literally says there was an earthquake that split the Temple Mountain too, and the curtain was ripped in half. And this wasn't just like a curtain like you hang in your bathroom window. I mean, this was massive, spanned the width of the inner sanctum. That this thing was ripped in half, literally, figuratively, and there was an earthquake that went straight through the temple. Flavius Josephus tells us. So there was this amazing ripping of this thing, but now, but now, again, there's something else placed in the way. It felt like for a minute, victory was at hand, only for another thicker veil to be put between God and mankind. And as we reflect on the significance of Easter, on the first Easter, Resurrection Day, what are the lessons we can draw from our lives? As you're sitting in here today, what's, what's in your way? What's been the biggest barriers in your life to God's presence? What's been the biggest hindrance in your life to maybe having a soft heart towards God? Maybe you knew Jesus at one time and now maybe you're far away. What's, what's that thing? Is it some habit you can't kick? Is it the relationship? Is it something terrible that happened to you? Or maybe is it something terrible that you did that you can't, that won't seem to stop following you around. Like, what's your something that's in the way? Where do you feel like those first disciples that you should be camping out front seat, front row seat to what God's gonna do, and you're like, we just give up? Have you walked in here today? Do you maybe feel given up? 
Maybe this is the first time you've been in church for a long time. Maybe you feel like a Flintstone. You got dragged in here by your hair today, kicking and screaming against your will just to acquiesce. I'll go, I'll go, we'll get, I'll get a free lunch from you. Okay, I will come. What's in your way? What's blocking you from, what's hard around your heart? What's clouding your vision? What's hindering you from realizing all God has for you? Because this is the day when uh, Christers in, in, in mass come to church. Christers are the Christmas and Easter people, right? Who come and you're like, oh, wow, that just got personal. Um, but like that, that's what, why they come and when they come. Like what's it from being a tokenism of maybe a cross or a church attendance or maybe something, that, an experience at one point in time? What's, what's that thing in your way that's keeping you from all God has for your life? Because let's just, hear, here, here's the bare facts. Every single one of us is in deep need of Jesus. You might say, oh, I'm, I'm a strong whatever. I, I, I don't need anything. You will. You will. We'll all come to that place at some point in time and we'll realize our need for Jesus. What's the, what's the block? Is there a dream maybe that, that you had or a vision or a call or a hope that's never come to fruition? Is there a person in your life maybe you've been holding out hope that they would give their heart to God? Is there maybe that thing you've been praying for forever and it's just never happened? The list can be long, but um, what's in your way? Where do you need a miracle? Where do you need that giant immovable immovable stone pushed out of the way? Are you waiting at the door uh, like these women or are you like the dejected disciples who have just vanished and their hope with them? Or maybe this is all new to you. But even if it is, if you're hearing the Easter story for the first time, I'm guessing there's a reason you're here. That there's something God wants to say to you today. For me, a hurdle that's been in my way is I've been dealing with some failure of late. There's been some things I've gone through personally and I just haven't felt like I've got enough. I've been um, acutely aware of my deep need for Jesus and my um, amazing proclivity to mess things up and to not have foresight, to not have amazing capacity, to just whiff on so many levels. I'm becoming more and more aware of that than, than ever. There's been something in my way. And, um, and sometimes what can happen is when we miss too many times or we believe so hard and that thing doesn't happen, it can cause a couple, like a couple emotions and cause us to be ticked, to be disillusioned or afraid or just to completely give up. Are you on any one of those spectrums today? I'll tell you, I know Jesus doesn't want for you to be afraid. One of the first things that you always see angels or God when they encounter people in their, uh, in their luminous form, they often say, don't be afraid. They say, don't be afraid. And I think wherever you are in your life today, God would say to you, don't, don't be afraid. And I would also say that I think one thing that we learn in this story is there's no stone too heavy for God to move. There's nothing in your life that God can't take care of. I don't know if you walked in here and you're thinking like this might be the last day of your life. Maybe you wanna die, maybe you wanna take your own life, maybe, maybe you've considered it. I would tell you there's no hurdle, there's no rock, there's no thing that's too big that God can't take it from your life. And there's maybe a lot of you here who have tried everything. Maybe you've tried Buddha, you've tried yoga, you've tried tarot cards, you've tried financial pursuits, you've tried substances, you've wielded power, entertainment, sex, uh, relationships, politics, shopping, stuff, and none of it has supplied what you were looking for. There's something in the way. 
Why can we sing like Bono? I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Like you can go everywhere, do everything. And the problem is, is there's a God-shaped hole, Blaise Pascal once said, there's a God-shaped hole inside of everyone's heart. I think there's a thing that's inside of all of us that's, that kind of gets this sense that there's more beyond what we can um, acquire or ascertain in our five senses. That there's a deeper realness to even the things that we can't see than there are maybe to the things that we can't. We know that it says like, uh, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter three that it's God's put eternity in the, heart, in the hearts of men but there's many things that the world, the flesh and the devil will throw at us to obfuscate our view and our ability to discern what's on the other side of that rock. What's that thing that has to be gotten through? And I think some people are willing to try anything but Jesus. I have a family member, she will do anything and try anything except for Jesus. And often, friends, the one pill we won't take is the one that will actually cure us. What needs moved or changed in your heart or mind? As we think about Easter and resurrection, what does God want to resurrect in your life? What does God want to um, make fruitful in your life? What does God want to heal in your life? What does God want to um, give clarity to in your life? What needs moved? What's in the way? He said, this is the message, I've risen. Maybe you have a heart of stone. Maybe the biggest barrier in your life is your heart. Maybe the biggest barrier in your life is you've been, you've been rejected, you've been wounded, you've been kicked to the curb, you've been disappointed, you've been disillusioned, and the hardest thing in the world is not the things out there, but it's this thing right inside of you. It's this middle thing that unless I get this answer or unless I get this thing, unless I get all at once, God, I will never take a step forward. Or I tried that before and you failed miserably. Or I sucked at it so bad. I was a bad Christian and I was a hypocrite and I'm never going back to that embarrassment. What's the thing in your way? See, in Ezekiel chapter 36, it talks about how God would long to give his people, he would long to take from us a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Is your heart hard today? It might be, this is more than I bargained for on Easter. I'd say, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Because I think it's very serious business what we're talking about today. About where our heart is with God and the condition of the soil of our life. That I think it's very serious business. I think actually the most important question you will ever answer in your life is who is Jesus Christ? There's nothing more. There's no calculus. There's no equation. There's no, um, there's nothing you will ever come up against that is more important for you to decide on than who is Jesus Christ. Because these people saw, and I think people are still seeing today, like he's, he's, he's the one, he's the one who actually moved away this rock. He's the one who gave all these forecasts. Like there are thousands upon thousands of prophecies in the Bible and just about Jesus, like Messianic uh, prophecies, just specifically about him, there's an insurmountable amount of, um, an uncountable amount of prophetic stuff for thousands of years that point to this one guy. I mean, like I grew up Jewish. And even if you go into synagogues, there are certain passages you just don't read in synagogue because if you do, it's sure fire, they would know it's Jesus. Like people, they won't read, they won't read Isaiah 53 at this time of year, Isaiah 51. They won't read these things because it's so clear the suffering servant of God was Jesus. There's very clear passages that it's Jesus and I think some of us will do anything but like believe that maybe it's Jesus and the one thing that's missing in our life is Jesus. There's something in the way. And just like springtime, 
when the first resurrection happened, it marks a time of year where dead things come back to life. So Easter reminds us that um, Jesus died, gave his all for our sins. He died in our place. We took his test. I mean, he took the test and we get his grade if we want it. But he says, there's only one way to me and it's through me. The God who can remove boulders. The God who can raise from the dead. The God who can overcome every relational barrier you have. The God who can overcome every issue you have over every hurt, every cry, every concern, everything you've got, Jesus can do it. And not only he's a God that can, he's actually a God that wants to. Like, Jesus is a God who is deeply, deeply fond of you. No matter what you've done, Jesus is fond of you. And when he was up there on that cross, and I believe those three days when he was in the depth fighting for your freedom, he was thinking of you and did not care what kind of luggage or baggage has come in here with you. He moved that rock, he can move yours too. And I believe that no matter where we are, just like on that first day, Jesus was knocking on the other side of the door. He knew those women were outside the door. The book of Revelation, it talks about, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus stands at your life today and knocks. And he says, and anyone who will open, I will come in and dine with them. He says, anyone. He says, the worst person to the valedictorian, I will come in and I will dine with you. I care about you. Your life matters to me. I overcame tremendous obstacles for you. It was a test, actually, that I passed. No one else could. It was so great a test, no one else could. It wasn't some fictitious thing. It wasn't some ethereal thing. It wasn't something of legend. He actually said, it's a real test. And you all tried to make it and take it. And you still try to over and over again with your attempts at success, at your hopes for purpose, at your trying to please and satisfy yourselves or protect yourself. He actually said, no one else can do that but me. And he says, and the best thing about it is I wanna share it with you. I wanna move that rock from your life. And I just want you to step back and watch what I do. You don't even have to know how I do it. All you have to believe is that I can. I can do it, he would say. Jesus moved rocks. He moved mountains. Jesus did impossible things. Like, like, that, like that passage Lucas read, like, do you know that Jesus, Jesus created everything. It says that all of creation was made by him, through him, and for him. Like, do you know Jesus made everything? Dallas Willard, in his amazing book, Divine Conspiracy, talks about this principle, and you may have heard me say this word, of Jesus as the smartest man. He said, what I think is lacking a lot of times in people's pursuits to not only give their lives to Jesus, but become apprentices or disciples of Jesus is we've lost a sense of Jesus as the smartest man. In this age where tech, um, where, where tech advancement is mounting day by day, week by week sometimes, we forget Jesus is the smartest man. And all the miracles medicine can do, we forget that, <clears throat> do you know that Jesus Christ took people that were leprous or had broken bones, or distorted um, things in their body, and Jesus just touched them. Jesus, the God who made the molecules, knew how to touch them and manipulate them to recreate and heal the molecules. The God who created weather, he knew how to step out of the boat and tell the storm to stop because he knew what it takes to dial it up, and he knows what it takes to dial it down, and it just takes his voice that there's amazing uh, prophecy in Job, that they said that this son of man, Job's like, who will redeem me? Who will help me? And it says, he said, but there'll be this one, like this son of man who walks on the waves. That'll be the one. And Jesus says, yeah, I did that too. I'm the one you were looking for. And as Barry talked about last week, that Jesus is not always the savior 
we want, but if we'll do it on his terms, he's always the savior we need and he's the, actually the only savior that there is. Jesus is the smartest man. Jesus knows how to fix your life. Jesus knows how to heal your brokenness. Jesus knows how to touch your family. You might say, well, how can me coming to Jesus have anything to do with my family? Because a lot of times, you know, that it says in Luke 10, Jesus sent the disciples ahead of him to all the places he planned to visit. Jesus may just want to work in your life and send you ahead of your family because he wants to visit there. And as he grows, changes, and heals you and me, maybe we'll be more um, available and we'll be more useful in our families. Maybe the stuff where we stubbed our toes for generations, he says, now you have an all-access pass to it. I'm the, healing, I'm the healing you need. And by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony, maybe you can go tell he's risen. That's the message. And I know as he's moved more and more rocks all the way in my life, that it's a better message for other people, but it's also a better message for me. Because I'm not coming to this thing, I'm not coming at you today. I'm not coming at you, I, I should not be up here. I should not be up here. Some of the things I was born into, that I've experienced in my life, that I've done in my life, and it's only the magnificent working of Jesus that I'm up here. Because there was something in the way for me and Jesus is like, I can remove every barrier. I can remove every stone. I can change your heart. I can heal your life. I can touch your lips. I can touch your relationships. I can touch how you feel about yourself. Some of us, our biggest problem, like I said, is us. Our self-esteem is so low, we're standing on it. And we just maybe have belief for anyone else except for that God could and would and wants to use our life. Where do you need breakthrough? Where do you need that veil torn? Where do you need all access passed to God today? Where do you not believe Jesus can help? Maybe the world's evil and it's filling up with people and situations that can't be matched. Jesus is like, I overcame death. He says, actually, the same power that raised me from the dead, I wanna share with you. I give to you. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority. I can do it. I can do it around you, I can do it in you, and I can do it through you. I can do it. He's risen. So what's the thing in your way? What do you need moved? What do you need changed? What do you need healed? What do you need put back together? Where is doubt crippling you? Where's fear? We have such an anxious, fearful society. So many people are just live in fear, somewhere between rage and fear, and usually rage is the secondary emotion of fear. Where do you need Jesus' touch today in your life? What we're gonna do today is we did something a little different is um, we, we normally uh, do the Lord's Supper during, uh, during worship. Uh, like communion generally happens kind of between second and third song. You can just kind of rinse and repeat and expect it. Well, we wanted to throw you for a loop today. Just kidding, that wasn't the, the point at all. What we wanted to do today is I just felt like these rocks, Lucas had a great idea, like just symbol, symbolizing like the thing that's in the way in our life. And we believe the Lord's Supper is not just something we do as some rote, perfunctory thing. I would actually encourage you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, don't take it. I would really encourage you not to take it. Don't feel any compulsion from us. If everyone else gets up and you just sit in your seat, I encourage you, if you don't know Jesus or don't, know, or don't wanna know Jesus, don't take it. Because he says it's really serious. He says when you drink, he says you're drinking my body and my blood. You're remembering what I did. You're aligning yourself with it. You're realigning yourself with it. But I would say if you're like, dude, I think I want what you're talking about today. There's been something in the way in my life and I want it moved, or I wanna come back to Jesus, or I wanna have this new relationship. I want this freedom, this hope you're talking about. Because I think one of the most amazing things is if you look at the difference between like the women and the men in that story was the women were the ones camping out, waiting for it. 
and the men had to be convinced. Doesn't that sound like a lot of our churches? Women will be camping out waiting for it and the men will be like, oh, I gotta be convinced. But wherever you are today, male, female, or whether your heart's hard, soft, or you're coming back again, or you're brand new, like what's in your way? What do you need taken out? So before we take communion, we're gonna sing again, but I want you to, um, I want you to just pause before you come up and just think, what's in my way, God? And maybe you're like, I, I love Jesus so much. Then he would just say today, he would just maybe reveal an area where he wants to come closer to you. We all have stuff. Like I said, I've been licking my wounds a little bit lately and I was acutely aware as I was getting this message ready, like Ryan, I wanna deal with this thing. Your failure is not a big deal to me. I don't really need you to succeed. I just need you to be faithful. <coughs> Faithfulness and success aren't always the same thing. At least not in God's economy. So I've had to deal with that some. So what would God have you deal with this morning before you take the Lord's cup? So we're gonna sing, invite you up, and then I'm gonna lead us through a time of communion, all right? And I'm just gonna pray, and worship team, you guys can play. Jesus, we just thank you. I thank you for the people here. I thank you for their hearts, for their lives, for everyone's here, Lord. Whether they're regular, or they're coming back for the first time in a while, or they're visiting, or maybe, um, here for the first time, Lord, would you just do something amazing in people's hearts and lives today? Where there's something in the way, would you break through today, Jesus? Break through, whatever it is, that there be nothing held back. Lord, you didn't hold back your love for us, even the fact that you gave your own son for us, Lord. We know there's something in the way of so many people's lives from belief in Jesus. Lord, would you, in understanding Jesus and going all in on Jesus, maybe you're like, I come all the time, but where's there that hindrance in your discipling or disciple making? Where's, where's, that, where's that thing in the way? So Lord, would you just minister to people's hearts today and show us what's in the way, King Jesus? Would your love break through? In Jesus' name.
encourage you to uh, come up. There's communion in the front and there's back stations to take it. And you're welcome to take your rock with you if you want uh, like a reminder or something to chuck at someone later on. Or, or if not, you can just drop it in the bucket. But um, we're gonna take the Lord's Supper uh, right now. And Jesus, one of the things that, that he did was when he was, we take this in remembrance of his last supper he had with his disciples, where he took the bread. He took the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the wine. We don't have wine here today, sorry. We don't have enough in our budget to give everyone wine today. But, um, but he took the wine. He said, this is my blood. My blood shed for you, poured out for the remission of sins. That thing that was in the way for everyone. He says, I'm going to solve all that over the next couple of days. So if you want to come, uh, come and get communion and take it at your own uh, leisure. And I want to invite you after that. We're going to keep playing for a minute. We've got prayer teams that come forth. Maybe like today, something resonated with you. You're like, I, I don't want to walk out of here with this thing in my way anymore. Or I don't want to walk out of here stuck like I've been. Or I don't want to walk out of here. Like I feel like I'm understanding this whole Jesus thing for the first time. Don't leave here today because the Lord, he stands at the door and knocks. And the kingdom of heaven is not something that just runs in front of us. A lot of people are like, oh, I'll just wait till the end of my life and do that. Do you know that the kingdom of heaven doesn't just run in front of us? It actually runs parallel with us. In Hebrews 3.15, like I said, today when you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. Because we don't ever know when it's over. We don't ever know when it's at. We don't ever know how far that in front of us is. And so when you hear his voice today running parallel in your story, don't harden your heart. So what would God say to your heart today? So we're going to take communion and then prayer teams ask you to come up. And if you would love to receive prayer for anything today, healing, relationships, your body, your mind, your heart, or or you just want to give your life to Jesus, we want to invite you to do that today. Lord, I just bless my church. I thank you for what you're doing here. And I just ask for your heart to be poured out on people. I pray where there's something in the way that you would remove those barriers, those blockages today, that thing that's clogging the drain of our life, Lord, that you would do what only only you can do. And if your heart's feeling dialed up and you're feeling like kind of like nervousness or you're feeling warmth or some coolness, that might be Jesus' presence resting on your life today, encouraging you to, he wants to do more today. So when you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. Lord, would you overcome our hearts of stone or the things people put in front of us or just the barriers we have? Would you meet us today in your precious and powerful name? It is only you can do, Lord. We take these things out of our way. Bless you.